Whenever we asked our participants how many times they would see their Facebook pages or their Twitter feeds, they didn't have a specific answer because they had the feeling that they were in those pages all the time. So this actually speaks about the, the fact of living in media rather than using the media. Welcome to the Distribution Matters podcast. We've been doing a series of informal interviews with presenters at the upcoming Distribution Matters pre-conference event, happening soon at the International Communication Association's annual meeting in San Diego. In each installment, we've spoken with folks about their research on media distribution and how it intersects with civic life and popular culture. This time around, I'm joined by Maura Matassi, whose voice you just heard, and Pablo Bachkowski. They've been working with Eugenia Mitchellstein on a project that they'll present at the pre-conference. Specifically, they've been speaking with young adults in the U.S. and Argentina about how they get their news. I'll spare you the suspense. Social media is a big part of it. So are smartphones. And more than anything, social media on smartphones. What interests Mora, Pablo, and Eugenia, though, are the ways in which the shift from older ways of getting the news are more than a simple change in the sort of screen you consume it on or whether you're reading from a newspaper or a phone. A frequent refrain in our conversation was the notion you just heard Mora introduce of living in the media as opposed to using it. To set up the idea and illustrate how young people often encounter news these days, Pablo gave an example from their research of a young woman who goes out with one group of friends only to spend a substantial portion of her time checking her Facebook feed to see what her other friends are up to. Right, so she was as connected to the others who are not collocated with her as she was with the people who were collocated with her. And in the process of doing that, a piece of news showed up on her Facebook feed. Now I remember, it was Facebook. So she ended up interrupting the sort of a friendship information gathering process to check on a piece of news about her hometown that she found intriguing. And, you know, a few seconds or minutes later, she went back to the online and offline sociability. So that shows you how much, you know, even if you are going out with your friends, I mean, it's a moment of leisure after the work week, etc. You're still connected with other friends who are not with you at the time and you are connected you know, to them via social media on your smartphone. And in the middle of that, a piece of news shows up. So you pay a little bit of attention and then you move on. It's not that you deliberately went to a bar on a Friday night to read the news on your cell phone. <laughs> You went out to do many other things, and on top of that, you ended up consuming the news incidentally as part of living in the media. This idea of consuming the news incidentally, as Pablo puts it, isn't unique to the digital age. For example, he says, we used to scan headlines at the supermarket checkout or as we passed a newsstand on a city street, and we might also overhear snippets of news in other people's conversations while waiting in line or riding the bus. But, he says, it used to be that a lot more of people's news consumption was purposeful, not incidental. There was the idea that you would sit down to read the newspaper and while you were doing that, that would be your primary activity or sit down to watch television. And not only those were the main activities, but it was something that you would primarily, intentionally, purposefully uh, set out to do. Today, at least for younger cohorts of users, incidental news consumption seems to be the norm. This also means, Mora says, that anticipating the context for news consumption is getting a lot harder. We had cases of interviewees that will tell us that, for example, they were, as they were entering the cafeteria of the university, they would open their Facebook pages very randomly and they would encounter a very important piece of news that had happened yesterday, for example. Or we had other interviewee that told us that when he was going through Nanga and he was seeing some jokes, he found out about the presidential debate results. Uh, through a joke. So, I mean, this relates to the fact that there is no context that we can predict and that it can happen as this very incidental, not look for activity for you, young users. And if the places and the moments in which news is consumed are changing due to mobile and social media, Mora points out that some of these same shifts are also driving changes in the context in which we receive news and headlines. So it's not the same reading a newspaper, a piece on a newspaper, than reading a news that is surrounded by, for example, jokes or memes or a photograph, a photography of a dog or a post made by your friend. I mean, that all those kinds of contents 
that surround your news, the news that you're reading, definitely transform the experience while you're reading it. So it kind of transforms the hierarchy of the news. And that's something important to uh, take into consideration when we're analyzing incidental news. All of this discussion of context brings us full circle to the idea of living in the media as opposed to using it. As Pablo puts it, the younger generation doesn't use the media anymore. In particular, again, for the young segment of population, for young adults, we get the sense that most of them do not use the media as you use an artifact, like you use a thermostat, you use the telephone, you use the television, you use the car, but rather that they live in the media, right? The media constitutes for them an environment, a milieu, in which most of their lives happen. And you know, it is a, a, it's not just a difference in vocabulary, it's a difference in the texture of their experience, it's a different in the amount of, difference in the amount of time that they spend on the media and the value that they assign to all things mediated in their lives. Of course, this difference in the texture of young people's experience and the way they value media also has ramifications for the news business. Pablo says that if you want to get a sense of how power structures are shifting within the journalism and media industries, looking at how 18 to 29-year-old users are consuming news is a good start. They are on Facebook, they are on Twitter, and they encounter news uh, that way. So uh, that is a key transformation because um, it is a result of very different engagement with the media, and it's an engagement with the media that highlights the power of distribution platforms Right? that today are, I'm sorry for redundancy, but much more powerful than what they used to be, mediating between the senders, quote-unquote, of information, like news organizations, and the uh, you know, receivers of the information, quote-unquote, the audience. Because what happens, as you know, in these uh, distribution platforms is not only the Facebook algorithm, say, but it's what other people in your social network are redistributing, retransmitting, um, through this network. So it is the platform, it is the, your, your social network, and at the combination of both, you get a second order editing process that filters and highlights information for you, and that is a remarkable change from how news got distributed and consumed, you know, a couple of decades ago. Pablo Boczkowski is a professor at the Northwestern University School of Communication and co-director of the Center for the Study of Media and Society at the Universidad de San Andres. Mora Matassi is coordinator at the Center for the Study of Media and Society at the Universidad de San Andres, and they co-authored this ongoing study with Eugenia Michelstein, her assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences at the Universidad de San Andres. This podcast comes to you from the UMass Amherst Journalism Department, where it's hosted by me, Josh Braun, along with Lucy Martirosian and Jess Eklund. All our past episodes have been produced by Lucy, who is now off for the summer, so any mistakes are entirely my own. Our series features presenters from the upcoming Distribution Matters pre-conference event at the annual meeting of ICA, the International Communication Association. The Distribution Matters pre-conference is organized by Ramon Lovato, Amanda Lotz, and me, Josh, The event and this podcast are possible thanks to the ICA Media Industry Studies Interest Group and the ICA Journalism Studies and Popular Communication Divisions. We're especially grateful for financial support from the Media Industry Studies Interest Group, the University of Michigan Department of Communication Studies, the University of Massachusetts Amherst Journalism Department, Communication Department, and College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the San Diego State University School of Journalism and Media Studies, and the Culture Digitally Scholarship Collective. However this reaches you, we hope it finds you well, and we'll be back soon with another installment.